On the next episode of Painting and Travel, we'll visit a private island along the main coast. Roger selects a nautical view, and Sarah goes through the magnificent restored summer cottage speaking with the owners. Today we're just north of Portland, Maine, and we're on Clabbert Island, which is a privately owned island. Some friends of ours own it and have invited us to visit their historical summer cottage. And this is what Roger has chosen to paint. We're right down here by the water. These floats have washed up, they're lobster floats. I thought it would make a nice painting, lots of color, a simple composition. So I'm going to set up my easel and get started. Well, I've got my easel set up here. I'm using an eight by 10 inch masonite board covered with gesso. Then I have this thin wash of burnt sienna on here, which will give me a nice warm tone to start with. I have my glass palette. I'm going to sketch this out as accurately as I can. First, I'm going to use charcoal because when I put the charcoal on there, I can easily just rub it off. And then when I get the drawing where I want it, I'm going to go over it with pencil just a little bit. So when I paint, those lines won't come off. I'll do that, I'll put some acrylics out here. While I do that, let's join Sarah up at the summer cottage. This is Al Hoffman, and he and his wife Dawn worked very hard to bring this home back to a standard that they were satisfied with, and they've made it into a wonderful summer cottage. And it's an historical home, and I'm hoping Al will share some of the information with us. Well, thank you. Uh, the island is called Clarin Island, as you know. And uh, <clears throat> most of the islands out here have Indian names, or various names that the early settlers uh, gave them. This island was actually a, um, a mill, had a mill on it, the Clabberville Mill, because when the early settlers started logging the area, beautiful specimen trees and all the islands, <clears throat> they started with the islands first because it was easiest to get at the lumber and cut it and ship it and transport it. So they bring the logs from the other islands to this island and cut the logs into clapboards well, this is such a nice large cottage. Um, I suppose the original family had lots of children? Yes, well, the, the fellow that uh, had the idea for it was uh, Samuel Frederick Houston uh, from Philadelphia. And uh, he was one of the founders of the Penn Central Railroad, one of the Blue Bloods of Philadelphia society. And so he bought the land. But he passed on before he was able to do that. His son, Henry Howard, used to finish the house. The story goes that he had a hundred uh, workers from the boatyards over in Portland coming here and building, and built this house in a hundred days. A hundred workmen building the house in a hundred days. That's right. The fireplaces have an interesting design to mm -hmm. them. Every fireplace seems to have a motif of, the, say, the bow of a ship. The workers, uh, having come from the shipyards, introduced the idea of that architectural motif. It's very attractive, mm -hmm. and I like the way the carpenters have um, mm -hmm. embellished it. With a, a you know what's interesting? Uh, all of this wood is, uh, is uh, exposed and uh, not painted. And uh, in some of the beams and so forth, you can see the fingerprints of the workers because the oil from their hand prints uh, has remained on the beams. So that gentleman left his mark. There, uh, <laughs> and, uh, over 110 years ago. In the sun parlor there, though, if you see that we have um, some silhouettes. I noticed Those that. silhouettes up there. And um, that's an interesting story, too. Uh, the great granddaughter said that the German governess uh, would cut uh, shadow silhouettes from guests that were here. Because uh, the house was electrified in about 1904 or 05. And uh, the it was quite a novelty to have electric lights in a home. And so this parlor game of um, cutting silhouettes became fashionable. Yes, so, well, instead of having the instant photograph, you can have the instant so, so, likeness uh, silhouette. So they would cut those out and they put the paper up on the wall 
uh, in, a, in a sort of a fascia freeze. And over the years, the paper deteriorated, but it left the a protected area underneath it. And so you can see the reverse silhouette of the, the ladies in their Victorian uh, hairdos and the men with their beards, uh, quite, quite distinguishable. And that was very interesting. As a matter of fact, we picked up on that and started the same tradition in the dining room. And so the first year that we were here, uh, we, we did the paper silhouettes <laughs> and we put them up on the wall in the dining room. And as, as, you can, as you can see in the dining room, we have the white paper up there and hopefully in a hundred years, our silhouettes will be indelibly impressioned on the, on the wood. <laughs> no doubt. I think that's a wonderful tradition to keep up. Yesterday, I was walking in the garden, and I know you have three gardens, including an antique garden with a darling playhouse. And I suppose that was an original. I saw it in a yes. photograph. Well, the Houstons uh, were great travelers. They traveled to Europe quite a bit, and we found some of their old steamer trunks up in the attic. They loved uh, particularly things German. And so they saw this uh, German chalet style design building in Germany and came back and built a, a version of it for their children as a children's playhouse. And uh, they had uh, two boys and, and uh, two girls and, uh, and, and I'm sure they spent many years playing in this playhouse. Unfortunately, uh, World War I came along and the boys, the two boys, 18, 19 years old, volunteered for uh, military service. They went to Europe mm -hmm. and they were killed. And mm -hmm. so this was a, a, a great tragedy in the family. And Mr. Houston was so upset, particularly with the war of the Germans, he took all of the antique that they had that were German in the house and took them out in the bay and dumped them. And as, and as a matter of fact, we have recovered pieces of their porcelain pattern uh, uh, from the shore called sea glass and uh, silver that has washed up over the years. As a matter of fact, then up in the attic, we, we found uh, some a World War I uh, field gear. Uh, a I cot. saw that sleeping pot and it's uh, protected. Uh, with, a, mm -hmm. with a net, the netting and the uh, German helmet, bugle, canteen. It was obvious obviously it belonged to one of the boys that was shipped back to them and they left that uh, there and so we've kind of left it up uh, on display. We arrived here one day and uh, we found these little uh, bluebells uh, up on the top of the tent and there and um, they, would, they were dried and, and uh, it's obviously something left that in, in memory and from in the last season we were here they weren't there. And so uh, I asked her caretaker about it, and she said she didn't know anything about it. Well, it was obvious those bluebells had been put there just recently, except that it wasn't the season, they weren't even in bloom. And so we don't know how the flowers got there, but they got there. It's a friendly ghost up there that uh, memorializes the boys. It sounds like someone is remembering them. Yeah which I thought was uh, was interesting. After going through your office, there's a wonderful long dining room. That's a beautiful dining room. The staff would come down from their attic through the servant stairs right down to the, to the kitchen and prepare all the meals. Well, the owners and the occupants of the house never used that. That was a, that was a service kitchen. So they didn't even need to visit the kitchen. No, they, they didn't. They would go into the dining room. And and so all their meals were taken in this and large... And magically come up on the dumbwaiter. On the dumbwaiter. And and they would take all of their meals in this big dining room. So the dining room was spacious and large to accommodate all the guests and for most all of the meals. You've been so nice sharing it with guests. And, uh, well, we're, we're delighted, Sarah, Sarah, to have you and Roger here. Oh, you're very kind. And, uh, we know that you can appreciate it. It is magnificent. Thank you very much, Thank Al. You. Well, it really is a beautiful place to stay. We're so lucky to be able to stay at that lovely cottage. Well, I have my drawing finished. I put out a few paints. I'm using acrylics. I have titanium white, ultramarine blue, Indian yellow, 
and alizarin crimson. Those are transparent colors. I'm going to put out a few opaque colors in a little while because we've got those opaque bright reds and bright yellow. So at that time, I'll be putting out some cadmium red or naphthol red and some cadmium yellow. Well, it's always hard to know exactly where to start on a painting, but I generally start with my dark, so I guess I'll do the same thing today. I'll mix up some ultramarine blue, Indian yellow, put a touch of red in it to cut that down to make it darker. I'll start by putting in this dark foliage in the background. It really helps to get like an accurate drawing because then when I start to paint like this, I don't have to think about my drawing or my composition quite as much. It's more like fill in the blanks, paint by number. Since this is transparent, I can see all my pencil lines through here. And if I left the chalk there, the chalk would have gotten absorbed in the paint. I wouldn't have been able to see my lines. I would have lost them. So it was good I put those pencil lines in there. Even if I go over this post here, I can still see the line through this dark green. But I want this dark to begin with and really lifeless and colorless because I want to be able to put my, my lighter beautiful greens over that so they'll come out. So this starts, gives me a base in which to work from. I can hear some of the lobster boats, fishing boats go by as I sit here. There's also two osprey nests on the island and an American bald eagle and I can occasionally hear the ospreys. I think I'll make my brush work instead of making even strokes. I think I want to get really nice brush work back here. Just a kind of a hodgepodge of brush strokes going every which angle because I think I want my more powerful brush strokes to be on these floats. I don't want the same looking brushwork throughout the whole painting. Put some darks right in there. We have some driftwood right here. It's very nondescript. A little difficult, I think, to describe or paint. I'm going to just block that in with the dark colors right now to begin with, and we'll deal with that in a little while. This driftwood that makes up the stairway is uh, very bluish in color. I'm not sure where it's getting its color from. I guess maybe just the natural age of the wood, but of course in the shadow side it's picking up the uh, blue because it's reflecting probably the water down here and the sky. Let's mix up blue, white. Now those shadows are quite dark, so I'll dip into my other colors, gray it, but I still want that bluish tone. There we go. Maybe, maybe that's right. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's probably pretty good color. As I go along, I'll have to adjust these colors continuously. I think instead of putting the dark side and the light side of this post here, I'm going to make it pretty much all dark to begin with. And then I'll put the light areas over that. In other words, I'll put the darks in and then I'll put the highlights or the sunny side to the right of this over the dark color. Because there are some textures and other shadows and things. Now I don't want to get this all the same color either because as, as I look at this, some of these blues are a little bit warmer and some are a little bit cooler. I'll grab some yellow, just change the color just slightly. We also have some shadows right under these stairs here. So they'll go right about in here. We also have some very dark colors under these stairs. So I'm going to pick up my blue primarily in red to make another dark color. Drop it right in here. Now there's some perspective on these stairs. One reason I wanted to get very low, I'm sitting in a low chair, put my easel down low, is I, I didn't want to be looking down on those steps too much. I thought the composition would be better if I was more or less looking straight onto them so these floats could be featured a little bit stronger. And that's why I'm sitting down so low. But there is a perspective to these stairs. And some of the stairs are above me, a few of the stairs are below me. So the horizon line would be wherever this stair is exactly parallel to me, where I can only see I can't see the top of the stair or the bottom of the stair. That's where the horizon line would be. That's assuming the steps were level and they're pretty level. So this is about where the horizon line is. Now the perspective on these stairs would end up going to a vanishing point way out here somewhere, be way out there. So that means the stairs start to go down like this. And so I see the bottom of the stairs here. As I go up, I see a little bit less of the stairs. As I get to the 
horizon, I just see the edge of the stair. And now as I get above, as the stair is above me, I'll see the underside of the stairs. And that, the vanishing point, will go down to the same point here, of course. It's only one vanishing point. But it would be sloping down. This one would be horizontal. The rest of these would be sloping up. So it makes a big arc like that. That's just one point perspective. Now the tops of these stairs are catching a little bit more sunlight. I think my main job right now is to get everything covered on my board. I'm more interested in getting my values right than I am getting my colors right. Of course, I'd like to get the colors right too, but I have some flexibility with the colors, but I have less flexibility with the values. Values have to be pretty accurate, and when I say values, I mean the difference between the, the lightness and the darkness of the object. Before I start with these floats, I'm going to make this darker back here, and I'll let some of the color that I had in here before just shine through. So I'll get a nice variation of colors in the background. This variation in colors, by, putting the, by having the burnt sienna underneath, then by putting that darker, dull green on the top, and now putting this purple over that, I, I, what I'm hoping is it's just going to make a rich variety of colors to look at. It would be a mistake for me to start out with just maybe sap green or hooker's green, and maybe adding a little red in it or something. This is going to give me much richer a feeling with just using these three colors, I believe. Well, these are transparent colors, but if I put white in them, they'll become opaque, as white is opaque. So I'm going to start these floats with just my Indian yellow and some white. If I were just to put Indian yellow on here right now, it would be transparent. We could just see through everything. It, we'd see this burnt sienna through it. It's white, lizard and crimson, totally the wrong color red. I'm not worried about that yet though, so I'm just going to put this in here, maybe with a little blue, because this will act as my shadow side of this red float. Well, I think maybe now it's time to put in some of the highlights on the railings, because I've got my dark colors in, I've got a few of my light colors in, and now let's work on some of the middle tones and then some of the highlights. These posts, on the one side, they'll be a little bit cooler, and the, on the warm, warm side where the sun is hitting, we'll make some warmer colors with some Indian yellow and white. And my other two colors, since I only have those three to work with, I don't have to think about searching for another color. And it might be good to have some other colors out here, maybe some earth tones. Burnt umber is always a good color. Of course, burnt sienna, which I had on the, as a base coat. Uh, yellow ochre is also a good color to use in situations like this. Now I notice on that post, a shadow side is very cool in color and the light side here is, is warmer, but all in all, the whole thing is cool. So it's a matter of relationship between one color and another. So even though this will be warmer on this side, it still, as I see it, tends to be a cooler color. It's just not as cool as the shadow side. This post right here is, has a curve this way. But as I was drawing it, I think I wanted to change that composition a little bit and make the curve go this the other way. Because if its curve is going this way, it sort of brings my eye back into the painting. If the curve were running this way, it sort of kicks my eye out. So it's almost straight now, but if I have any curve at all to this, I'm going to make this curve bend this way. That way it just sort of gives me that nice flow rather than have my eye kicked out of the painting that way. I'm always careful not to put too many of my highlights in until the very end. I save that just for the last touches. Well, uh, this of course is dry, so let's mix up green with my blue and Indian yellow. I don't want to get that green too light because the very lightest things in my painting are of course these floats. And as I squint my eyes, I can see that clearly that the green is very dark compared to this here. So I don't want to get this anywhere close to having it the same value as the yellow. This flower is growing everywhere around the island, wildflowers and flowers in their, in their beautiful garden. But some wildflowers are growing on the beach, so it might be nice to add a few flowers down here, which I think I'll do instead of putting in that driftwood. And that one lobster float is black right here, but I'm not gonna use black. 
Just going to take my alizarin crimson ultramarine blue and that will give me a nice dark color. And even though black paint was used to paint the float, it's not black when you see it in real life because it has all the influences of other things around it like the sun, the sky, the grass underneath, all that. So it's really not black. It was painted with black paint but once it gets out in, into life, it absorbs all the color around it. Now it's time to start adding a few of the details in here. Well, I like that color, very warm purple. I'm going to put a little bit of that in here. Even though there's no clouds in the sky, which has been great today because when we've got a cloudy sky, it changes the whole scene very quickly. But now it's so, so sunny with no clouds, this scene is not changing at all. So it's very good to work from today. I've got a nice shadow from this float coming across the post. So I'll mix up a purplish color. I think I'll just take that same color from the shadow and drag it across this side of the float. And then with some water, just soften that. I'm putting out cadmium yellow light. Put some red here, cadmium red light. I'm going to put that very bright yellow in. And on the top of this float, I'm going to use just pure cadmium yellow. What a beautiful color combination this is. We just have these brilliant greens in the background. I'm going to make these a little more brilliant back here. We've just got the brilliant reds and the brilliant yellows. And what makes these brilliant is all the dark grayer colors around it. If I had made too many of these steps too light, too bright, and too intense in color, then these floats would not stand out. Now these stripes, I have to be careful to get the nice curve on these. It's easy to make this curve stop at the edge and not feel like it's curving around the float. So when I paint these, I think to myself how that curves around to the other side. So I just don't make a line that goes from one side to the other and stop. In other words, I just don't make a curved line. I, I start in my head, I start this way, I follow it through, and then I follow it back to the other side. I'm coming through the front of it, and then I can feel it curving around the back side. There, you see how I kind of hook that back around there. Pick up some white, just a small amount of yellow, a little highlight right across the top of that one. Well, now that I have my cadmium yellow out and we have the blue, this will make much more intense green. And I can put a few more touches here with my small brush. Just holding my brush very lightly and just letting it sort of make its own line down here for a few of those stems. And we'll put some leaves out here, those intense bright green leaves. Everything is pretty close to me. I don't have things far in the distance. So I don't have to deal with too much atmosphere. But even, even knowing that, the little uh, plants up here right in the foreground, these little ones here, they are closer to me than the ones in the back. So in order to show that a little bit better, I can make the plants here in the foreground a little more intense than I do in the background. So right down here, we'll just add a little bit more color than back here. Most artists like myself love to paint old things. If we have a choice of painting a new metal barn or an old falling down wooden barn. Of course, we're going to paint the falling down wooden barn. Same goes with something like this. I don't think I'd want to paint new floats. These just have so much character. And I've always wondered why we, why artists tend to lean towards that sort of subject. And last night we were having supper at the cottage here and we were eating on a table and sitting on chairs that were very old and very distressed. And they were left like that because it just fit in with the whole beauty of the kitchen. But had the whole kitchen been like that, it would not have worked. What made that work was the addition of the beautiful 
refine things around it, like the flowers, the beautiful pot, the nice silverware, the plates. And that, with the combination of the old, made the entire beautiful picture. So I think the same thing applies to paintings. When artists paint an old barn or these old floats, for instance, that's the rustic furniture, that's the old table. But what surrounds all those things in a landscape is the foliage, the trees, the landscape, and that's the refined element, I believe, in nature that really puts those old things together with the refined things to make a beautiful painting. If everything were just old and beat up, everything in the entire scene, it would be a little bit uneasy, be a little bit unnerving. But those combinations of the old with things with character and the beautiful refined things, and these trees are definitely beautiful and refined. You just can't get any more perfect than them. So this idea of perfection along with things that have lost their perfection and gotten this, this age of character, that makes a beautiful picture. Well, I'm just about out of time here. I do want to put some finishing touches on this, so I think I'll take it up to the cottage where I can work on it in the shade and put those details in that I need. For more information about painting and travel with Roger and Sarah Bansimer, visit paintingandtravel.com.